swans and Russian barley are inevitably associated in many people's minds because of Swan Lake, which is the most inspired of Tchaikovsky's famous ballets, produced in the 1890s when Russia led the world of dance. And there's another reason too for making this association, which is often confused with Swan Lake, and that is the dying swan danced by the legendary Russian ballerina Anna Pavlova. It was she who was the first person to take ballet far and wide beyond Europe. No town was too remote for her, no theatre ever too insignificant for her to appear in. To the general public in the earlier part of this century, it was her name that symbolised dance. And she did have an extraordinary affinity with swans. A memorial service for Anna Pavlova is held each year on the 23rd of January at the Russian Orthodox Church in London. Although it is almost 50 years since Pavlova's death in 1931, her name is still cherished by old friends. Her young admirers are far too young ever to have seen her dancing her solo, The Dying Swan, to the music of Saint-Saëns. That is the only record of Anna Pavlova's voice, and it was filmed just here, in the garden of her home, Ivy House in London. Not long after her death, this memorial was placed in the center of the pond that used to be graced by her beloved swans. The garden's rather large, and still very well maintained. It's sloping down the side of Hampstead Hill. I think she must have spent some of her happiest moments here on summer days like this with her friends and the animals and birds that she loved. At present, the Anna Pavlova Museum 
is set up here each Saturday afternoon. There's the dummy her costumes were made on and the old sewing machine and some of the headdresses she wore in her ballets. And over there, the dressing table that she had in the Palace Theatre during her first London season in 1910. And beside it, one of those nostalgic old wardrobe trunks that everybody used to have when they traveled by boat. On the side here, it says Cape Town. It seems that Pavlova used to have 20 of those when she traveled. And some of the furniture that she brought from St. Petersburg when she first took this house. There's a photograph of her here, sitting in perhaps this chair. There's something marvelous about all her photographs. I think any dancer can learn so much just from studying how the angle of her head is always expressive of the character she's portraying and the movement of her arms and her body completely graceful and soft and expressive. I can't help trying to imagine the life of that extraordinary woman and artist who revealed the beauty of ballet to millions of ordinary people all over the world. It seems when I think about it that she really had very little life outside of dance from the minute that her mother took her to the ballet school in St. Petersburg when she was 10 years old. In due course, she graduated and she was soon a quite exceptional success on the stage. Most ballerinas in Russia at that time would have remained securely in the imperial ballet where they would be acclaimed by the Tsar and the noblemen and showered with jewelry and rich gifts. And that was her life for a time. 1912 seems to have been the real turning point in her life. That was when she and her husband bought Ivy House in London. And it was the only permanent home she ever had, although she was very rarely here, because for the next 19 years, she danced incessantly, touring the world with her own company. They covered 300,000 miles, visiting North and South America, South Africa, Europe, India, the Far East, and Australia. No town was too small or too remote for her to go to, and no one who ever saw her forgot that magical experience. This is her solo to the music of Rubinstein's Night. That was filmed in 1916 in California when Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford persuaded Pavlova to record some of her dances at their own studios. This solo filmed in slow motion is Rondino.
marvel of a disregarded pure ballet technique when it suited her because she was only interested in being expressive. Virtuosity had no meaning unless it was served the purpose of dance. And yet at the same time, she had a speed and a strength which it would be hard to equal today. And these came from her training in the Imperial Ballet School, the same school that is now the famous Kirov School in Leningrad. The film called Children of Theatre Street shows how it is today. The original school was founded in 1738 by a French ballet master, Monsieur Landais, with 12 boys and 12 girls, the children of Imperial Palace servants. French is still the universal language for ballet, just as Italian is for music. Even the youngest pupils know that the step they're practicing is called ton lié, meaning steps joined together smoothly. It's an exercise for changing the weight from one foot to the other without losing balance. They'll practice this same step in more difficult forms as they progress to advanced levels and they become graduate students preparing for their daily class to begin. All the teachers were themselves once students in the school and ballerinas on the stage. Now they hand on their knowledge to younger generations, helped by the pianist, who's an institution on her own, loved by everyone. She's played for so many classes, watched so many young dancers rise to fame, that she knows every movement by heart and understands exactly what music the teacher wants. Everyone is equally involved in this daily pursuit of perfection. That's the Kirov tradition. Here is the fountainhead of a style in training that directly or indirectly influences all ballet to east and to west and across the oceans. The fine traditions of training in Russia were curiously enough formed mainly by French ballet masters because it was the French who founded ballet. And of all those ballet masters who made the long and difficult journey to Russia, I think the first important one, Charles Didelot, is the one that I find the most fascinating. For one thing, he was the first person to put dancers on wires so that they would seem to be really flying through the air. His first flying ballet was done in 1796 at the King's Theatre in London. Like all early ballets, the plot concerned mythological characters and very probably looked something like this. The ballet is recreated by Mary Skeeping. Pickle Zephyr is too easily diverted by the attentions of some wayward nymphs. To punish him, Cupid takes away his wings and gives them to Flore. When Zephyr repents, Cupid restores his wings and the story ends happily.
I must say I'm very glad I've never had to fly in a ballet. Of course, it isn't used very much now. The choreography is so much more developed and advanced that there's no need for these tricks. Although Didelot must really have worked pretty hard all his career, even with simple steps, to have created almost 170 ballets and dances. So with all his talents, he was able to raise the Russian ballet to great heights for the first time. By contrast, in America, a young man like Didelot would have had almost no opportunity at all to develop his talents. There simply weren't any teachers. Nevertheless, John Durang, who was born in Pennsylvania, an exact contemporary of Didelot, did manage to become America's first notable dancer. His own watercolor sketches show his ambitions in a variety of dances that he had to pick up as best he could, because it wasn't until he was already in his 20s that the first ballet dancers, emigres from the French Revolution, began traveling west to settle in the New World. But Durang had firmly established his success in 1785, when, a lively 17-year-old, he burst onto the stage in his hornpipe. Wayne Sleep impersonates John Durang. During John Durang's lifetime, there was no real ballet in America. But not long after his death, two little girls aged 12 and 14 stepped out onto a Philadelphia stage, and they were to become America's first classical ballerinas. The 14-year-old girl, Mary Ann Lee, became America's first Giselle, and her partner was certainly American. His name was George Washington Smith. The younger girl, Augusta Maywood, was really amazing. She starred at the Paris Opera when she was only 15, and that was at a time in 1839 when Paris was the absolute center of the ballet world and Augusta, the first ballerina from across the Atlantic. Her career in Europe was so long and so successful that she never returned to the United States at all. In 1848, she was in Milan working with Jules Perrault, who was the greatest choreographer of that period. And later the same year, Perrault went to St. Petersburg where he was one of the most important French influences on Russian ballet. He created several new ballets, and he staged his own version of Giselle following the original Paris production a little earlier. And it's basically Perrault's version of Giselle that we all see today. This was the first ballet I danced with Rudolf Nureyev in 1962. In the second act, Giselle's spirit returns from her grave to be reunited with Albrecht.
The first act of that ballet, Giselle, takes place in a country setting when the peasants are harvesting grapes. And that's very typical of the mid-19th century ballets because choreographers like to take every opportunity to use the colourful folklore from all over Europe, adapting the costumes and the dances rather freely to suit their own ideas. And here in Spain, there must be a greater variety of fascinating dances from all the regions than anywhere else. Spanish dancing has such a variety of unusual rhythms and interesting steps, even in the folk dances, that any traveler in the mid-19th century frequently came across scenes such as this, a jota danced by some villagers. Young people still enjoy these old traditions. The only difference here is that the boys in this group are mostly at university. The dancer is studying electronic engineering. In 1845, an attractive young Frenchman called Marius Petipa came to Madrid to join the ballet, which was very popular here at that time. The company had 116 dancers, which was a very big group. As well as being the principal dancer, Petipa also choreographed five ballets on Spanish themes during the two years he stayed in the country. I think he probably would have stayed much longer if it hadn't been for a romantic adventure with a beautiful Spanish girl which led him to fight a duel. And as a result of that, he had to leave the country very hurriedly. He went to St. Petersburg, and much later, in his 60s and 70s, he became the most important of all the French choreographers who went to work in Russia. One of his greatest successes was the four-act ballet, Don Quixote. And that Russian ballet on a Spanish story, choreographed by a French ballet master, is danced now by all the nationalities of the world. Yoko Morishita and Tetsutaru Shimizu are from Tokyo. The pas de deux is often danced alone as a concert piece. This is the opening and adagio.
in Russia, where Petipa spent 56 winters working for the imperial theatres, I'm not surprised he sometimes thought back to his days in Madrid and put Spanish dances into so many of his ballets. For Don Quixote, produced in 1869, the music was by the popular composer Minkus. But 20 years later, when Petipa collaborated with Tchaikovsky on The Sleeping Beauty, imperial Russian ballet began to reach its greatest glories. Tchaikovsky lived in this house at Klin. He wrote to a friend, I can't tell you how much pleasure I find in this quiet solitude I always longed for. The plate says P.I. Tchaikovsky, at home Mondays and Thursdays, three to five. Not at home, please do not ring. Of course he was at home. It was just that he didn't want to be disturbed. He was very busy composing. Maybe he was finishing off the Nutcracker. It's nice to think Tchaikovsky was happier in this house than at any time in his life. It's the Sleeping Beauty, a first edition. As far as ballet goes, Tchaikovsky's work was a major landmark because the music being written for ballets at that period, except in operas, wasn't considered very important. The public went to see the dancers, not to listen. And the best composers generally weren't interested. In fact, Tchaikovsky's friends thought that he was wasting his time writing The Sleeping Beauty. It was Mr. Sevolozhky, the director of the Imperial Theatre St. Petersburg, who brought Tchaikovsky and Petipa together. Because Petipa and choreographers in general didn't believe it was possible to dance to music that was complicated. And I think that's the main reason why they didn't get better composers. There were exceptions, of course, like Delib, who wrote Coppelia, and Tchaikovsky was afraid he wasn't going to be able to write a ballet as good as that. But from my point of view as a dancer, there's no comparison between dancing Coppelia and dancing Swan Lake or Sleeping Beauty. The amazing thing is that Petipa did find it very hard to do the choreography, and the dancers found it so difficult that they lodged a protest about it. And we think it's the most perfect music for dancing. Just over there is Tchaikovsky's bedroom. And next to the bed is the bookcase that has his collection of foreign authors. He studied English specially because he wanted to read Thackeray and Dickens and Byron in the original. And in the corner, the very simple wooden table where he wrote his music. I love this little alcove room. He used to like to sit here and have tea, looking out of the window at the trees. In the summer, he sometimes used to work here. It seems to me that all the most important performances of my life were in Tchaikovsky's Sleeping Beauty.
the turn of the century, the whole mood changed. Petty Pass seemed suddenly old-fashioned. Well, he was past 80 and still working. But the new generation of dancers wanted something fresh and different. And this they found in the young Russian choreographer, Mikhail Fokin. At this moment, Serge Diaghilev, a man of enormous artistic vision, swept them all off to France, and the tide was turned. The Russian ballet came to Paris. It was 1909. Paris was the capital of the civilized world, but nothing like the Russian ballet had ever been seen before. In the first season, Anna Pavlova in Les Sylphides with Fokin's choreography was a revelation, and then Tamara Kassavina proved to be the perfect interpreter of Diaghilev's ideas and his brightest star beside Václav Nijinsky, who astounded everyone. When he jumped, he seemed to pause in the air before coming down. Fokin was the brilliant choreographer of the early ballets. He made Spectre de la Rose, Scheherazade, Petrushka, Firebird. And the Parisians were overwhelmed by the dancers, the splendor of Russian music, and the exotic designs by Benoit and Baxt. Diaghilev had an infallible instinct for finding the best in every artist, and his genius was to unite music, dance, and painting on equal terms. Igor Stravinsky and Pablo Picasso composed and designed for him, and Jean Cocteau caricatured them, as they all gathered around this extraordinary man who was like a magician controlling and directing every detail himself. Marie Rambert, who is now over 90, joined the Diaghilev Ballet in 1913. The first time when I met him, I only listened to what he said. You know, when one is young, one doesn't yes. straight away say he belongs to that category or to this category. But uh, I, I found that he was a most inspiring man. I mean, he could work through the night to get the lighting he needed. And every detail had to be as he had conceived it, and he understood wonderfully well. And uh, he, was, he was a man of tremendous ideas, tremendous taste, and great, great capacity for work. Nobody worked like yeah. Diaghilev. Don't forget, he ran a most important literary magazine yes. in, in Petersburg before he came to And on painting, the stage. he presented uh, painting oh, he, exhibitions. Painting, painting exhibitions. Yes, yes, several painting exhibitions he brought to Paris. Mm. He was a man of tremendously wise culture, and mm. also he was a great connoisseur of art, mm. because it was he who had this idea to get great artist painters to do yes. ballets for him. They would have a, a, the, a scenic designer. A scenic than, designer. Right. They had very good scenic designers, yeah. but they were only scenic designers. It was Diaghilev who first thought of that, to have a great artist. And he certainly, the art of ballet at his time, seems to me, was at its great height. And he wasn't afraid of doing modern music or anything. Yes. But he died so young. Yes. It was terrible, because there hasn't been anybody like Diaghilev, not yet. Monte Carlo was the home of Diaghilev's Valley in the later years of his life, and a bust in his memory stands among the palm trees between the sea and the famous casino. He died in 1929. The amazing thing is that he always produced innovations and surprises, although he never had any secure subsidy. He depended on private patrons, and the Prince of Monaco gave the company a haven where new ballets could be rehearsed and presented. 
in the beautiful theater that adjoins the gaming rooms and faces out over the blue Mediterranean Sea. This is the foyer. Over here is the theater and the people promenade here in the foyer in the intermissions. This building is just about 100 years old. It's really lovely. And over here, something that I like very much, some models of the early Diaghilev ballets. And here, this is 1914 Paris, the Coq d'Or. Marvelous colors, absolutely glorious designs. Natalie Goncharova. And this one, Petrushka. Really love that because when Benoit designed this, he remembered the fairs that they used to have in the street in St. Petersburg when he was a little boy. And he's put exactly all the colors, the characters, and everything in from his childhood. People queuing for the box office. And here's the entrance to the theater. Petrushka with choreography by Fokin and music by Stravinsky is about a puppet with a soul, or is it a fantasy? Mikhail Baryshnikov dances the scene in which Petrushka, alone in his cell, is resentful of the tyranny of his owner, the magician, and laments his love for the ballerina doll. <laughs>
Serge Diaghilev really moved ballet right into the 20th century. And probably he was able to do so much because he was completely independent, unlike most ballet companies, which were part of some national opera house like the Paris Opera or the Russian Imperial Theatres. In fact, Diaghilev's ballet russe never appeared in Russia at all. So when he died in 1929 in Venice, his dancers and choreographers had to find work wherever they could around Europe and America. And that was how it happened that after the French ballet masters had been going to Russia for 200 years and developing the ballet there, the situation suddenly reversed and the Russians came and settled in the West. Among them was George Balanchine, and he's the one who has evolved a new style in classical ballet dancing that belongs to modern America. It's pure, unemotional dancing, a style that he used first in a ballet he choreographed for Diaghilev in 1928 in Paris. The ballet is called Apollo, music by Stravinsky, and the pas de deux is danced here by Vivian Lorraine and Desmond Kelly. So the inspiration for dance moves about in continuous ebb and flow from France to Russia, Spain, England, America. And what Petipa did in St. Petersburg with Tchaikovsky Valleys, Balanchine from St. Petersburg does in a different way in New York with Stravinsky. And in the 21st century, who knows where it'll go?